Hey doing, folks, welcome to the GM's Alcove. Got some Pathfinder 2nd Edition adventuring for you today. We're going to be playing Menace Under Otari. Now, this is the adventure that comes in the Pathfinder 2E Beginner's Box, so spoiler alert, if you plan on playing that adventure, you might want to hold off on watching this episode. Uh, also, this episode is the beginning of our campaign, a learning campaign, uh, which most of the players have never played Pathfinder 2nd Edition or even role-playing in some cases. So it'll be a new experience for everybody. I'm relatively new to the new 2nd Edition rules myself, uh, though I am a veteran of D&D and Pathfinder 1st Edition. Uh, so it should be interesting, it should be fun. Now for our PCs, our adventurers, the companions, if you will, we have Sigrid, far from the north. She is a female, blonde-haired warrior, a fighter. And she comes from the Saga Lands and has made her way long and far to get here to the Isle of Cortos uh, by land and sea. Next we have Beric the Dwarf, a scholarly dwarf. Uh, he comes from the Five Kingdoms region, which is the Dwarven Lands. And again, it's far across the sea on the mainland. And he's somehow found his way here on the Isle of Cortos, perhaps to seek out uh, knowledge at the city of Absalon. We shall see. And then we have Farley Tell, a whisper elf, uh, who is native to the Isle of Cortos, actually, unlike the other characters. Uh, and he is a wizard. And finally, we have Ramirez, a human rogue uh, from the lands of Cheliax, again, somehow finding his way on the Isle of Cortos. And already from the very beginning, he finds himself mixed up in the underworld of Otari. As I mentioned, this is a learning campaign. Uh, what that means basically is we're going to, during gameplay, stop occasionally to look up certain aspects of the rules uh, to help the players understand the new Pathfinder 2E rule system. So if you're new to Pathfinder 2nd Edition, maybe this series of videos will also be useful in that regard. But for a little backstory to our adventure today, uh, three of our companions, Farley, Sigurd, and Beric the Dwarf, have been basically hired by the Otari fishery to solve a mystery in town. Some fish have gone missing in a basement which has a large hole carved in it. Something broke in and has been stealing the fish. Farley, Sigurd, and Beric bravely made their way into these tunnels, fighting off giant rats, negotiating steep crevices, and uh, making their way to a passage filled with webs. There they encountered a giant hunting spider, which, to their knowledge, they defeated. But in reality, the vile creature merely feigned death, and we might see him make another appearance as the adventure progresses. However, unbeknownst to the three companions, Ramirez, the fourth companion, or he soon will be, uh, descended into the very same caves many, many hours earlier in the dark on a mission of his own. So in a way, he's basically separate from the other PCs, and he will be introduced to the other three characters during this session. So this is the setting. This is the backstory. This is where our adventure is going to pick up. We're going to start off by having a look at Ramirez and seeing what he encounters as he descends these caves. You might remember a place called Plaguestone. I do. It was months ago. He left that little dirt hole of a village, leaving the others behind. Found your way south to the port city of Taldor, outside of Cheliax. Not within Cheliax. You, you're out of Cheliax, where you were born and raised and spent most of your life. And you found your way on a cargo ship, heading to the Starstone Isle, many miles south. Long journey days would pass before you reached it. The Starstone Isle, also known as the Isle of Cortos, home to the greatest city, the city at the center of the world, known as Absalom. Oh, wow. One of the most biggest and most diverse cities in Galarian. You have found your way to this island. Isle of Cortos, Absalom. Yeah. You're on that island, and you've been here for weeks now. You found mm -hmm. your way to a small port city on the southern side of the island called Otari. A little fishing town. Mm. Right, right on the port of... Right on the... Right on the coast. 
of the inner sea. Now, Absalom itself, as far as you know, is many days to the east of where you're currently located. Nothing, not, not your concern. You've spent some time in Otari and have met up with some of the, the underworld. It's not a big town. You've got a map of that as well. But you've met up with a few of these folks and you've gotten to know them. It's not a big organization. It's not like a big guild of thieves or anything. But you've gotten to know some of the ne'er-do-wells here in Otari. And have managed to actually find a little bit of work here and there. As a matter of a fact, there's rumor in Otari that something's going on at the Otari fishery. Now, the Otari fishery is a place where all the fishermen bring the fish, the catches of the day, and they bring them in and they're stored there. And fish, seafood is a big thing here in Otari. That's where all the taverns and, and establishments get their food. Most of it's, you know, seafood and it comes fresh from the ocean. And before it does, it has to come to the Atari fishery. Rumor has it that something's going on at the Atari fishery. Something has broken into the basement and has been stealing fish. Lots of fish. Mm -hmm. But according to the underworld, one gentleman uh, in his little group of other rogues, his name is Kalthus, C-A-L-T-H-U-S, Kalthus. He's the head of this little group, and you've gotten to know him. He's given you a couple jobs here and there. He comes up to you and he says, you know what, Ramirez? I've got a sneaky suspicion that Halad might be behind might Halad might be behind this sneaking of the fish. Take another fish. <laughs> Halad, uh, he's a he's a he's a rival. We'll leave it at that. You don't need to know anymore. Right. But he might be sneaking in there and then taking some of that fish and causing problems for us as well as the other establishments here in the town. What I want you to do is to verify this. I want you to sneak in to the Atari fishery late at night, find out what's going on, see if the fish really are being taken. And, and if you can get some evidence as to what's causing it, if it's Halad, I think it is. And if it's him, that rat, I'll cut his throat. But I'm going to send you in. I'll give you a few coins now if you need a little supplies. So you got five gold pieces added to your inventory. Write that down on paper for now. And okay. go in there at night. Bring me back some evidence that who's doing this. If it's legit. Because it is just a rumor. But I have my suspicions. We don't want no rivals coming in here and, and causing a grief. So you find out for me. Get some evidence if this is legit. If the fish are disappearing. Mm -hmm. And if Halad is behind it, God, I'm going to cut his throat right. at Halad. Days go by, and you have found yourself scoping out the fishery. You find out that late at night, the shop closes, and it's there's nobody there. On one of these nights, one of the windows was left open, and you managed to sneak in using your stealth. Making your way to the basement, there's really not much here. I mean, there's, as far as you can tell, there's no hidden safes that you want to bother with at this point. You don't want to steal from the establishment, really. You just want to gather some evidence and see if there's a rival group of rogues, thieves, whatever, coming in here and doing this. See what's, see if it's legit. Because rumors is going on. It's, there's Something's breaking into the Atari fishery. You're going to verify this. So you make your way as best you can to where the basement is. You've been scoping it out. You know where it is. You sneak in. I want you to make a stealth roll for me. All right, stealth roll. Normally I make these, but I'm going to let you make it this time. You should have a nice plus eight to that roll. 26. That is good. You have no problem with that stealth sneaking in. There's no locked doors here. That Having the window open a crack was, was a blessing. You sneak in, you get to the basement, you, you you start moving your way down the basement. And that is where you currently are right now. Now, the torches aren't lit. I probably should have them off, but mm -hmm. we'll assume that you lit one of them. If you want to carry it okay. with you in the future, we'll do that. But there's three torches that are currently lit. There's nobody here. Let's assume that you can see everything you see. This is what you see. Now, in the room, 
the stairs leading into the basement of Atari Fishery creak with age as you make your way downstairs to find uh, what's been eating all the, the fish, if it is indeed a, a beast. In the center of the room, between two stone pillars holding up the fishery overhead, are barrels filled with salted fish. Two of the barrels have been smashed open, spilling their contents on the floor. In the east wall is a large hole. You can just see it opening into darkness. Wow. I see the debris on the floor. Mm -hmm. Well, I de definitely want to investigate the barrels. And I... Uh, well, I need to make a perception check to see if there's anybody in the room. All right. You move over to the closer to the opening. Uh, it looks like something pushed its way through here. You can't really tell what. There doesn't seem to be any uh, workings of tools that you notice or anything like that. It just looks like a lot of rock was just pushed and shoved right through. It looks like something pushed its way into here. Now, yeah. if, if you want to yeah. examine the, the opening further, I'll make another perception check for you. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, I made a roll for you. And from what you can tell, it, you can see evidence of tools, picks wow. and okay. shovels. There's some, something besides an animal. And rumor has it that it right. might have been an animal or a beast or something coming through here. But you definitely see pick markings and, and tools and shovels. Something worked its way into here. Let me examine the barrels. They seem to be disturbed, so maybe they were looking for something. The barrels are in the center of the room. Between the pillars, you can see them. Uh, inside the barrels, pretty much empty, but there's a few fish here and there. Something, this was definitely used to store fish, and something came in here and worked its way into these barrels, smashing them, uh, and took out the fish. So definitely something has taken the fish. You can see it spilled the on the floor. The fish are gone? For the most part, yeah, there's still fish here mm. and there, but something just recently took some of this fish. So I'm going to think about this out loud. Why would someone use tools to come to the basement of a fishery to exert a lot of effort to come through a wall and then open the barrels of fish and then take the fish? And it wasn't a beast because they're obviously hand tools. So... I would, I would like to, before I proceed into the opening, I'd like to look around the room to see if there's any clues, if anything of odd or unusual, All right, any, the... any tools, any tools left behind, things like that. Okay, let me make a perception check for you. Okay. You examine the room, and. It just looks like a storage area. There's nothing out of the ordinary other than something had worked its way in here, busting through with tools, and mm -hmm. something smashed into the vast majority of the barrels. Now, mind you, there's not as many barrels stored in here at the moment. As you've been casing mm -hmm. the joint, you've noticed that they've been using another area to actually store what supplies they have, but they're not big enough to hold anything uh, as much as they normally do until this... Obviously, until the situation is rectified, but you do see evidence of smashed barrels and crates, and most of the contents is gone, i.e. the fish. Something mm -hmm. worked its way into here and took the fish. It's pretty obvious to you. You don't see any evidence of footprints. You don't see any evidence of left behind that wouldn't normally be here in a storage area. Mm -hmm. And that's about mm -hmm. all you can tell at this point. Well, I'd like to grab a torch, maybe two, if okay. possible, and uh, wield them in one hand and work my way toward the opening of the hole. So I need to grab some torches off the wall. All right. Now are you heading to the hole? 
Yes. Um, my thought was is I could take one of the torches and throw it into the next room to illuminate the next room before I enter the next room. Okay. If possible. Go ahead and move up and to then, go ahead and move up to the opening. Show me where you are. Right here. Alright, the first thing you notice is you peer down into the blackness. You see that the Ooh. tunnel the tunnel descends uh, maybe 20, 30 feet down in steps almost. Natural steps of stone. Not, mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it was carved. They just like na look like natural uh, mm -hmm. stone. Yeah. So this has been here a long time. Yeah, tunnels. Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to proceed into the tunnel. Go ahead. I'm going to kind of keep close to the wall here. All right. Let me, let me scroll over. Okay. Squeezing through the hole, you find yourself in a cavern that seems to stretch endlessly beneath the streets of Atari. Who okay. knows what menace could be lurking down here? Up ahead, the passageway ends abruptly in a sheer cliff that plunges sharply into the darkness below. Now, because you have a torch, you'll be able to see what is at the bottom. 10 feet down, it drops. So it's not, it's not a long drop, but it is 10 feet. You'll take damage if you fall off that. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you want to do? It's barring your journey. At this point, you have a couple options. You could actually climb down this. It doesn't look like it'll be too difficult. There's some handholds you can grip onto. You'd basically mm -hmm. make an athletics check against this DC that I would determine. That's your difficulty class, DC. Uh, another option might be to tie a rope. You've noticed there are stalagmites around. You could actually tie a rope around one of them and scale it down. Probably easier than climbing it by yeah. hand. I'll uh, tell you what. Before I do that, I'd like to see make a perception check. It what appears to be eggs in the top right corner of the cavern. Yes, you could see them. It doesn't. They don't really look like eggs. They actually look like mushrooms. Mushrooms. Okay. Yeah, it looks. <clears throat> it's very damp and dark down here, so it wouldn't be unusual to maybe see. Some mushrooms, some fungus growing on the walls, but that's what okay. it looks like. It doesn't look like eggs. Right. They look like little big mushrooms, I must say. It's probably <laughs> worth just climbing it. Yeah, I'm going to climb down. It's very possible. All right, what I want you to do to make this climb, since you mm -hmm. really don't have any other options. Now, remember, you do have a torch in your hand. <clears throat> yes. While climbing, you're going to be considered flat-footed, so God help you if you get attacked. But doesn't seem to be a threat at the moment. You're going to make an athletics check. So go ahead and make an athletics check for me. This is mostly a strength test. All right. You begin to the descent. You get down on your knees and you start finding your way down the first five feet uh, without any problem. There's plenty of little handholds, some holes here and there. Some dirt begins to fall as you make the climb, but you have no problem getting five feet. Now, at this point, if you fall, it's just embarrassing. So go ahead and make another athletics check to see if you can decently make that final five feet. There you go. Final five feet. You just hop off. Boom. Land on your feet. You're all good. You're now at the bottom of this little cliff edge. All right. And, uh, I can still perceive that those are mushrooms or something. Well, if you want to move up to them and investigate, go ahead. Um, I'd like to make a perception roll first before I get too close, because they might have some kind of like nasty gas or spores that they shoot out mm -hmm. when motions. I see the the you know the the um, the vines on the ground or something there. So um, after I uh, I'm able to recover my footing and get down off the cliff. 
uh, I swing around and bring the torch to the what appears to be the the fungus mushrooms in the corner, and I illuminate the area. And what do I perceive? All right, so you move up to the fungus, and they're definitely mushrooms. Okay. Actually, they don't look anything unusual. You might have actually seen some of these mushrooms before, and they might even be edible. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. Well, let me. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna harvest that mushroom, the one that doesn't appear to be opened. Okay. You cut it up. It's pretty big. <laughs> it's a good foot in diameter. <laughs> Do you wanna, oh wow! Okay. You want to put it in your backpack, or do you want to chomp on it, and yeah. eat it, taste it, or I'll put, what? I'll put pieces of it in my backpack. Make a note on your character sheet, your inventory. You have some mushrooms. So, um, let me scroll up here. So now, I I see that there was another uh, another set of stairs descending. Looks like the tunnel continues north. From where you're currently located, the, con the tunnel continues to descend. You see these little natural shelves that are much like steps. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. I, I, I see something I don't like. <laughs> oh, God. I want to make a perception roll. I see things I don't like. The tunnel continues deeper underground, eventually opening into a large chamber. You can move yourself further in if you wish. Patches of glowing blue fungus cling to the ceiling and provide dim light. You can just barely make out vast strands of webbing across the floor oh, and walls of this cavern stretching between stalactites and stalagmites like shimmering curtains. I'm going to sneak down the path. I'm going to like go stealth mode down this path. As you descend the tunnel, where you see uh, mm -hmm. what looks like webbing, that is literally where there is webbing. <clears throat> now you can navigate through it, but I'm probably going to ask you to make an acrobatics check not to disturb it. Uh, other options, you could disturb it. You could set it on fire. Try to. I don't know if it'll light. It's very damp in this place. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is room to navigate through these webs, although, albeit, especially along the walls, it's quite treacherous. Yeah. All right, so... I see that if I went left, there's two two strands of webbing that if I went right, I'm not getting through it. If I went left, I, there's a chance I can get through it. So what I'm going to do, I think if I was, if I was dealing with a spider in real life and I cut one of the webs, it disturbs the spider. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to maneuver I'm going to try and maneuver this to the left along the wall okay. and go go around or go under the web. Uh, it looks like the web is kind of higher than I can go under it or something. All right. If you're going to try and hug or stay close to the left side of the wall, go ahead and put your token where you want. And mm -hmm. if there's webbing there, I want you to make an acrobatics check as you try and balance yourself between rocks and avoid bumping or entangling yourself within this web. Now, this is going to be slow going doing this. This will take some time if you're moving through yeah. a square with web in it. You don't want to disturb the web. Um, I was going to come here and then go here. All right, that's where you are when you made your first check. No problem. As far as you can tell, you've easily navigated through here. Now, up ahead, there's some opening, some space. You won't have to make a check if you move straight forward. Uh, but beyond that, you'll have to make more checks. Okay. So I'm going to have to make another check here because I want to go I want to go to the left. Here. So I'm going to make another check. All right, at this point, 
before you move any further, you hear something. Oh, shit. Something further to the north. Just just make it out. It sounds like uh, something is moving. Uh, and you hear this strange sucking noise occasionally. Like... No. Uh. And then it goes quiet. You don't see anything. Now, mind you, you have a torch in your hand. Hmm. I want to move to the left. We're using my that last acrobatic roll I just did. 27, you definitely make it across, no problem. You saw a nice big outcropping of a rock you're able to step on. There's no webs on it whatsoever. Go ahead and put yourself forward. Excellent. So I'm past web, webbing strands there. You are. And I'm still in stealth mode, and I want to go this way. Okay. No problem. Now, as you as you get to this point, you're hearing that noise again. It still sounds okay. a little distant, and it sounds like something's moving around. You, you, you also just briefly saw the web move behind you. You hear that sucking, okay. that sucking noise. Yeah, I need to move out of here. <laughs> All right. You move up this to the left now. You're going to the northwest, mm -hmm. and you're starting to scale mm -hmm. these sh little short steps of stone as you ascend upwards at this mm -hmm. point. Uh, no climbing checks necessary. Okay. And as you do, and as you reach the top... This is what you see. Looks like uh, some kind of crates or something. It's a barricade. It's got spikes on it. After the web-infested cave, the passageway leading deeper underneath the streets of Atari appears to be mostly natural, like before. But someone or something has worked to open the cavern and level out the floor when you reach this position you're in right now. You can see that. Making the passage easily traveled. To your right, a crude barricade made from old wooden planks and part of a barrel blocks the entrance to the side tunnel while the main passage continues off into the gloom further west. I want to go examine the barricade. Okay. Is the barricade... Can I dismantle the barricade? It would probably take some time, but you can definitely do that. Okay. I don't know what's on the other side of the barricade, so we'll we'll hold off right now on that. And I want to continue down the path this way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just then, you hear something behind you. From the barricade? Not from the barricade, but from where you came from. You hear squeaking. And you hear the moving of feet. It sounds like scurrying feet and chattering. And just then, you turn around just in time. And there before you, you see this dog-sized rat appear behind you. He's big. Wow. At this point, I'm going to bring up the turn order because, yes, this giant, what looks like a giant rat, has just appeared behind you. I would like you to roll initiative, but you're going to use your perception because you're not really using your stealth. You're being sneaky, but you're not really hiding from anything. You're wide open, easily spotted with a torch in your hand. Right. You got a 23. So you're up first. You see this giant dog-sized rat 
appear behind you. Now we're in combat now. We're in encounter mode. You go first in initiative every turn, mm -hmm. and you have three actions and a reaction at your disposal. I think what I'm going to do... <clears throat> Well, I don't, I'm trying to be sneaky, but like you said, I have a torch in my hand. So what I need to do is I'm going to, I'm going to approach the rat with one action. Okay. That's my move right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my first action is I'm going to take my long sword and stab him. All right. It's so the second action to draw it and then mm -hmm. a third action to attack. Mm -hmm. This will be your first attack with your long sword this turn. So go ahead and make that roll. No other modifiers. So you roll a 14. And all right, your sword comes. You, you start rushing forward and you make your attack with your sword. It's fully drawn. You got a torch in one hand, a long sword in the other. And you start swiping at this creature. But it, it manages to dodge each of your attacks. You do not catch it. What? Damn rat. And with that, the rat stands up on its hind legs and he bites mm -hmm. at you. He hit an armor class of 25 with his very nimble attack with his teeth. Oh my God. I... All right. So it attacks. You take three piercing damage. It attacks again. Mm. See, it'll be penalized, but... It does manage to hit you once again. It's not critical. And you take five more points of piercing damage. Brutal. This rat is just dancing around you. And with that, it's third action. It nimbly moves around you. Since you don't have the attack of opportunity ability like fighters have, you can't attack it while it's moving. So that's currently where it is. It is done. We're going to go to the next turn. Yeah, here's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to burn it with my torch, number one. That's my first action. I'm going to try to burn it. All right, so what that entails is you're going to make an attack with your torch. Mm -hmm. All right, so you got a 21 on it. It'll do bludgeoning damage, and it's going to be equal to 1d4. So you did actually hit it. It's not critical, so roll 1d4. Four points of bludgeoning damage plus you're going to do an additional point of fire damage, which is five damage in total. So you did a little fire damage, a little extra damage to it with the flames. Okay. While it's, while it's got the deer in the headlights look at the fire, I'm going to take my sword and pierce it. Okay, make a second attack. This will be your second attack with the long sword. Okay. All right, you slash at it, you poke at it, you do piercing damage in this roll, you did eight points of damage, you you skewer it right, right in the heart. It goes lifeless. Normally this would end the combat, but you failed to notice behind you scurrying over the barricade, the wooden barricade is not A spider. Is, is not one, is mm. not is not two. Perhaps mm -hmm. not even four or five, but coming over Rat. the barricade, you see these rats. And there you can see just one. And they come up over the barricade. I want what you, at this point, what I want you to do is go ahead and make a perception roll. Normally I do these secretly, but I'm gonna let you make this roll. Make a perception roll, straight up perception roll. No, you did not notice these guys at all. That's and terrible. It's not represented on the map at the moment, but there are a slew of these rats that begin to encircle you and they mm -hmm. begin to attack and they begin to attack. Suddenly, everything starts to go black before you even get a chance to react. These scurrying dog-sized rats just are en enveloping you and you fall to your knees and you can feel the piercing bites they put at you and the claws on your face as they scratch you. <laughs> everything, everything is not only going black, but it's going red as you feel the blood dripping over your eyes and you collapse, oh my God. you collapse to the ground unconscious. Some time goes by. 
after this. Your torch is no longer light. An eye pops open. Blood dried over your eyes. There in the blackness, you see nothing. Your eyes starts to pop, pop open. You're not sure what happened, where you are, but you're still alive. In total blackness, in total darkness. Suddenly, you begin to hear voices. Human? Huh. Human? Could it be human? Is that common you hear? You start to hear footsteps, carefully coming up the steps from where you previously were with the webs. Closer. They're getting closer. And it's at that point that we're going to end the session. And with that, Ramirez finds himself near death, unconscious and laying there exposed. And now let's pick up with what happens with the other three companions, Beric, Sigrid, and Farley Tell, as they descend the basement, over the ledge, and into the web-filled cavern. Now at this point, they will have defeated the spider, at least they think they have, and will now continue forward into the gloom. Menace under Otari. Now this is the scenario that comes in the beginner box, and that's where we're beginning this little learner's campaign, where we all learn the Pathfinder 2E rules. Beric, Farley Tell, Sigrid, which one of you three would like to volunteer to give kind of a little short uh, overview of what happened in the last session so we can all catch up? But keep it brief, and I'll give you an extra hero point. Anybody? Or do you want to leave me do it? Your choice. I'm, I'm, I'm game. All right, Ava. If nobody else wants to. You're the first one, Ava, so you get yeah. it. So you want me to go ahead? Go ahead and talk about last week's session. Okay. Last time we were all uh, uh, summoned to a fishmonger's shop, uh, one by one, where we met, and we were uh, informed by the the owner or manager of the shop that something had stolen lots of the barrels of the fish from the cellar beneath the shop. Uh, so we descended torches and blades in hand to see what had transpired down there and found a hole had been dug through the wall and we were attacked by some giant rats. We fought the giant rats off and, and, and slew them. And then we uh, proceeded into the hole, which uh, was dug by by tools, not rat paw. And we crossed a crevasse, we we explored the cave a little bit, and then we came face to face with a fearsome giant spider, which we also dispatched after a terrible fight. And that is where we ended. Exactly. Give yourself an extra hero point. You should have two hero points now. Again, everybody starts every session with a hero point. And you can accumulate more with through good role plan, good tactical play. Now, of course, as a reminder, on the screen is my view. The players can't see all these details that are kind of in shadows. They can only see where their characters are according to their light source in this case, because it's otherwise very dark. Now, that said, where they currently are in this one cavern area that seems to be overwhelmed with spider webs, it's actually blowing very, very faintly blue in this chamber. I think I failed to mention that in the last episode. But notice Sigrid, Beric, and Farley that there is a slight, very slight glow of blue in this room. Now, you defeated the spider whose carcass currently lays next to Devon, the NPC that I am playing. Uh, he's laying there on his back, legs all folded up over his body. You've definitely defeated the creature. You take a breather, you do some healing, uh, especially Farley. I think you were really gravestly wounded, and you're back up to full now. You should be at 11 hit points out of 11. Beric, you're fine. You have 17 out of 20. Uh, Devin, he's, he's suffering. He took a massive bite from that spider, and he was also poisoned. So he's down to 11 hit points out of 17. He's hurting. 
And Sigrid, you're doing great. 19 with out of 21 hit points. So everybody's good except Devin. Anybody? I could lend a hand. All right. What you, you got? Your healers kit. Yes, healers tools are on my inventory. All right, what you will do is you will make a medicine check. The DC is 15, and you will spend the next 10 minutes kind of patching me up. Yeah, it's the treat wounds yeah. action. And it gives you, on a success, 2d8 hit points. Critical says 48 hit points. So go ahead and make the roll. The DC is 15, so you make the roll. Just click medicine. Excellent. Not a critical success. So I get 2d8. You go ahead and roll that. Good way to start the session. Eight hit points. Not bad. Devin's feeling pretty good. Devin, by the way, is a cleric. He's level one. Uh, he's a good friend of Beric, the dwarf. Beric, tell us a little bit about your character. Just a little bit of an overview real quick. Beric is a cleric as well. Uh, he's a bit of a more like a bookworm type of cleric, interested in, in occult and religious texts. He has a mission regarding them. And what's the, who's the deity? Sherlin. So the goddess of art and beauty. Sigrid, how about you? You're the the party's fighter. Quick rundown of your character. Well, Sigrid is a tall, muscular, blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman from the Saga Lands, with a sword and shield in hand, and and she's very she's very present, right? Everything she does is done with passion and joy and and and. And and a gusto befitting of a of a proper saga, and uh, uh, as far as religion, she hasn't mentioned much yet. She may have mentioned something called Ragnarok. I don't, is that even a thing? But uh, yeah, she's she's outgoing and uh, down to earth. Awesome. And to contrast that, we have an elf in the party as well, the only elf, and that's Farley Tell. Tell us a little bit about your character, Farley. Uh, Farley Tell. Uh, they are a non-binary elf wizard. Um, they are similar to me, actually. Uh, very sleep deprived, very like bag under their eyes, sort of uh, a little bit weary looking in a very uh, thin frame. Uh, they are also uh very how do i want to put this like uh laid back in that they uh just sort of do not hold any sort of formal uh uh like awareness for danger or any sort of things even after they had just been through two dangerous encounters uh, and by the way, before we go any further, um, the party is actually investigating the missing fish under the Atari fishery, which is the main supplier of food in this small town. Most of the taverns and inns, most of the cuisine here in the town is, is seafood, fish-based. And the Atari fishery is the only source of food fresh from the ocean. And recently, rumors has it that there's been something that broke into the basement of the fishery and has been taking the fish. And this was verified by our party members here who were invited to the fishery by the owner, uh, Tamley Vandervale, <clears throat> who we met in the first episode. And for a little bit of coin and reward, if they can go down here, the party, and solve this mystery for her, all is good in the world. And that's where the party is at the moment. They just entered the, the caverns. We're just getting started here. Uh, in addition, there was something else about this. Uh, oh, she did not want word to get out that this so-called rumor 
is actually true. Something has been breaking into the basement and taking the fish. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, I mean, if you're in a restaurant, you don't want somebody telling you about the cockroach. Yeah, they, the, they would close this place down and investigate what's going on ASAP if that happened. And Tamley doesn't want that to happen. So here we have our party of adventurers going in. Now, Farley, he's been he's been actually been staying here in the town longer than the other party members. He knows a little bit more about the town. All right, so what do you guys want to do? Now, Farley, you have the torch currently. So you guys are free to move. Note that you have to battle your way through this this maze of uh silky strands of webbing. Uh so it does slow you down. It's not going to entangle you too bad. It's nothing to worry about outside of combat. But if you'd like to explore the place, go ahead. Just move your tokens where you would want. Should we check the portion of the room where the spider came from? Can we hack our way to there? Yes, it's pretty thick up there, but you can easily push your way through there. It's not overwhelmingly thick strands, but he came from the northeast portion of the chamber. You can see how it looks almost like a funnel web and a funnel spider's web. It's kind of like this little funnel that you can walk into and, and work your way in. All right, Devin moves forward first ahead of you guys. Uh, he has his long sword out, cutting his way through. Barrack follows up on his side. And Beric, you see, towards your left, closest to the wall, you see what looks like a little uh, shape. It's not overwhelmingly big. It looks like something, like a package, is wrapped up in webbing. Right real close to you, like about five feet in front of you. Well... Of course, I want to investigate, but I want to try to figure out what it might be before I touch it. I could poke it with my club gently. Definitely poke it. Yes. All right, you see what looks like a body. It's not a big body. It's only like maybe three foot long. It's like all encased, but you definitely see what looks like a snout protruding from it. Of course, you're going to have to investigate more and start pulling the web off of this thing, but it's not moving. It's not making any sounds, but it's definitely some kind of a humanoid carcass. I have a bad feeling about this. What would you like to do? What do you think, guys? Should, should we just start unwrapping the bundle it's probably something the spider killed and ate. i bet it's a desiccated corpse yeah let's let's open it up okay i trust you guys are guarding my back so i'll start to unwrap it In the meantime, Sigrid's going to work cutting away webs so we can get through here without problems. You start pulling away at the webs. It's not too hard to do, but you definitely see the appearance of scales on this creature that's in here. And it's it's definitely rotted. It's, it's almost a dried out husk at this point. Something has been feeding on this, and it was probably the spider. But it's all dried and can't really tell offhand what the creature was. It can't have been too tall or a lizard-like appearance. Uh, along with that, you also spot what looks like a sword kind of clasped in its hands and up around its chest. So there's a, a really nice looking sword actually in there. In addition, you also see what looks like a a little pouch on his waist belt. Do you continue to pull the body out of this encasement of webbing? Yeah. All right. I'm not as much interested in the sword as I'm in the pouch. 
So that is my main objective at this point. All right. It's easy to take the sword out. There's definitely a sword that this creature was was uh was holding. You can easily wipe it off. It's it's actually a really nice looking sword. Fine craftsmanship. The hilt. There's this beautiful gem set within it. I think I then if the sword is easy to grasp on, I'll take it for now from the corpse and continue going for the pouch. All right, you reach into the pouch. I put that in the chat. You can read that. Uh, but there is that vial of liquid. It's kind of red colored. Uh, what do you want to do with that? Take it? Do you want to test it out? Do you want to leave it behind? What would you like to do with that little vial? Uh, Farley... Do you have something that you could perhaps identify it with, or...? Now... Uh, I, could, I could take a look at it for right now, but in terms of anything magical to identify it with, uh, unfortunately, I'd be better off tomorrow. Gotcha. But right now, Devin does have the spell prepared. He immediately just casts it while you guys are decorating about what to do next. He casts it. He did actually detect some magic. So there is something magical within 30 feet of him. Be alert, my friends. It might be the sword. It might be the vial. Beric, what do you think? This is Devin talking to you. Well, I think we take them with us and... Let's, for now, keep going forward. All right, so you stow the vial. You stow the sword. I imagine you're putting it in your pack. It's small enough to fit in there. Unless you want to keep it at the ready on your waist. Make a note of what your choice uh, is. I think the, I can put the vial in the pack, but I offered the sword for secret. Uh, asking that, do you have a use for such a sword. I don't have any children yet. <laughs> oh, you're asking me if I want to use it. Yeah, to, if if Secret wants to have the sword, as I myself don't have any use for it. I can carry it. Then the sword goes to Secret. This is a really finely crafted sword, Sigurd. Really nice. Uh, it could be worth something, especially that little jewel that's inset on the hilt. Sigurd is very puzzled why a talented smith would make such a small sword. Hmm. Devin laughs heartily again. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> All right, you start moving to the northwest at this point. The tunnel starts to narrow once again. Uh, you see these stepped, naturally stepped shelves of stone going upward ever so slightly. Nothing to climb or anything like that. But you guys in some kind of marching order, if you will, so we know where people are. As you guys reach the top of this little plateau, the ground starts to smooth out here. After the web-infested cave, the passageway leading deeper underneath the streets of Atari appears to be mostly natural. But someone or something has worked to open the cave and level out the floor. This is where you currently are located. Making the passage easily traveled. A crude barricade made from old wooden planks, barrels, and crates uh, blocks the entrance to the right. While the main passage... To your left continues off into the gloom and darkness. Be careful, Farley. Don't wander too far down the corridor alone by yourself. Is the barricade on our right hand side like is it floor to ceiling or is it something like that was just designed to uh like slow people who were trying to get down there and, and can be fought over the top of? I mean, can we see over it? I guess is my question. The barricade? Do you want to investigate it? Take a closer look at it? Ah, uh, sure. Yeah, why not? All right. Life is short. I'll, I'll come over here and take a look. 
All right, move your token close to it. And I will make a nice secret perception check as you check this out. Uh, I'm going to die. <laughs> all of a sudden, it collapses atop of you. No. Ah, mm -mm. oh, well. <laughs> it's obviously made of, like I described, wood and stuff. It, it could be dismantled. Uh, you can barely peek over the top of it. Uh, but thankfully, to the because of the light coming from Farley, if we would get a little closer, maybe it would help. But you can definitely see the tunnel does continue on into the distance uh, as far as you can currently see. Suddenly, you, s you start to hear clattering noises coming from that direction. Very faintly, uh, uh. But, you hear, <laughs> but you hear clicking and clattering noises coming from down that tunnel. What would you like to do? Where are the sounds coming from behind the barricade? Yes. Sigrid just heard the noises. Ah, there's something down there. Something that sounds like... Sounds like crab pincher. Clack, 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 clack. You know, clack, clack, clack. And she's... Using her hand as her thumb and her finger is like a, a crab claw for emphasis. Well, any ideas what it could be? Could be crab. <laughs> as Farley moves closer with the torch, Sigrid, peering down through the cracks and the very top of it, you see about... Uh, you see what looks like it opens up into a much larger room. And you faintly see coming from that direction another blue light. It's very faint, but it's a blue colored light. Hey now, guys, there's a room in there and, and the light is coming. Now, the sword that we picked up from that... Uh corpse earlier was that the source of the blue light in the other room similar oh is the sword glowing <laughs> no i think it's just reflecting oh. light off of the torch well i am puzzled yeah. um... should we try to go through the barricade or should we continue down the hall and see if the tunnel curves back to the room. Propped up against the barricade, you notice this as you approach Sigrid and peer down it, is a body, okay. is a body. And oh. it's a human oh. laying on their back. There's a carcass of a dead rat, similar to the ones you encountered earlier when you descended from the basement, when you first entered. I, I kneel down to check how he is doing, and is there anything we can do for him? Uh, Devin has his sword out already. He says, be careful, Beric. We don't know who this is. He's all dressed in black and hooded. Is he... is he still alive? Well, there was some sounds coming from him, so I think yes. Not happy sounds. What sounds? I want to check the guy that... Is he wounded or is there something else wrong with him? As you approach and get a closer look, uh, Beric, suddenly there's movement and his head starts to slowly rise and his eyes begin to move, covered in blood all over his face. Ramirez, Bry Byron, introduce yourself. You're barely hanging on there. If you look at your hit points, you'll see how many you currently have. But go ahead. Help me. Do do healing thing to him. <laughs> well, I rushed to his aid with the healer's kit. Go ahead and make a medicine check. DC 15. You'll be occupied for the next 10 minutes. Uh, wrapping up this hooded character. He's healing up his wounds. So go for it. 
Medicine check. DC 15. Yeah. So, Beric says, everybody, please keep watch. I'll try to help this man. Sigrid will keep watch into the area where the barricade and the blue light are. Shield and sword ready. I'm going to watch for the spider. <laughs> More spiders, I should say. Crab legs, right? 14, that is a failure. You can use your hero point to re-roll a d20. So, I have reduced my hero points points to zero, so will I, do I just roll again? Yeah, just roll it again. Ooh. <laughs> now, here's... I am very sorry. All right, here's what happens. He has to take this roll. He rolled a one, which means whatever result he scores, it's going to be one worse in result. Now, an eight is a failure. On its own, it's not a critical failure. It would have to be five or less to be a critical failure. However, because he rolled a natural one, whatever his result is, is one worse. Failure becomes critical failure. So this is, in fact, a critical failure. It will cause 1d8 of damage. Ramirez is now at zero hit points. He has the dying condition, the wounded condition. He's prone and he's flat-footed, etc. He's dying. So what yeah, I'm going definitely to... the flat-footed one is is the big one here, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> now what I'm going to do, I am going to check every six seconds to see if he dies. He's going to make a death roll. It's a flat check equal yeah. to 11 plus his dying condition, which is one. So if he doesn't roll higher than that, he won't stabilize. And if he reaches dying four, he's dead. So at this point, I'm going to give everybody a chance to do something. You know, Beric, you messed up here. You know, he, he doesn't look good. His eyes shut and the air leaves his body. His body has collapsed there. What do you guys want to do? Sigrid, you're up first. What would you like to do? The, the, the potion that you found, maybe is potion of healing? Mm. I mean, at this point, are we going to make him worse? I wouldn't put a potion we found on a body in in some dang, some wounded guy's mouth. But if you have a better thing to put in there, now is the time. Yeah. Yes, no. Anyone else? He's healer? Yeah. Out of the way, says Devin, and he moves forward. And he does actually have the spell heal, but this will be his last one for the day. And he's going to he's gonna move close to the body and use a one-action heal. Seven points. So what happens, Ramirez? Add seven points to your hit points. Plus seven. You have the wounded one condition. You're no longer dying. And... So you're okay, but that's the last healing Devin has, and he's quite clear that that's it, my friends. Devon, my friend, you are a saint. <laughs> yeah, he, he pats you on the back, Beric. Don't worry, my friend. We all make mistakes. <laughs> Who are you? Who are you guys? Who are you, man? You got ate by giant rats. I know. There was lots of them. What are you doing here alone? What are you doing here? Probably the same thing you were doing here. Which is Which what? is... Looking for some fish. You're looking for fish? Yeah. There's plenty in that room that we came from. The one with the spider webs? <laughs> the one you came down the hole from. Yes, but there are less than there should be, and that is probably. Mm. 
your problem, it's my problem. You're being very uncooperative for a man we just found dead on the floor. I don't know who you are, but I think you can help me. Wow. My name is Rudra. What is your name? I am Beric. Nice to meet you, Ramirez. Likewise. What did y'all do to me? Uh... Pick you? Yeah. <laughs> in here is... Uh, some sort of knockoff. Cleric? I think he's a cleric. Devin, uh, Devin kneels down to your body, Ramirez. You have been healed, my friend. You were dying. We spared you. Thank you. Uh, I'm still coming to it. It's difficult to concentrate. Devin reaches around your reaches around your back and starts to raise you up from prone position. So you're standing up now and leans you up against the wall. You should be feeling okay. better now, my friend. It's okay. What brought you down here? I'm doing a job. I'm looking for something. Are you looking for fish, by chance? Yes. Stolen fish. Mm -hmm. We're the second wave, essentially. If you... I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to head back up, but I think we're going to have to head down a little bit further through this cave. Yeah, I, I was I was fighting a rat here, and I was ambushed by a horde of them, and they overtook me yeah. from behind the barricade there. They're probably still there. I hear something chittering. Sounds like crabs. And again, that's, he does the crab claw impression. That's them. They're humongous rats. That is rodents. Okay. If you feel like it, we could use the extra hand. But if you are feeling not quite so well, just feel free to go back. I'll tag along for a minute. I'll help you. You help me. Where are y'all going? Which, where did y'all come from? Which direction? We, we came from the room with the fish, just like you did. Right, but did you go into the other cave? The other cave. Yeah, we came from where the big spider was. I saw the way. Did you know it? Yeah, we killed it. I did not encounter a spider, so I snuck in here pretty, pretty well and didn't encounter anything until I was ambushed at the spot. I mean, I don't mean to brag, but my blows put the spider to flight. Flight from the mortal coil, that is. Then perhaps you should take point. I can't. He has torch. I go behind him, though. He's small. I can throw axe over him. Well, at least you're in the front of the echelon. Where else would they be? <laughs> I was proceeding down this cave yesterday, and that's where I intend to go. Now, Ramirez, you don't really know how much time has passed since everything went black. That is correct. Judging from the blood and how it's dried on your face, it had to have been a few You're hours. Uh, but you do know this, Ramirez, and you other guys don't know this, so ignore it. But you came in here at night. All right. Okay. And for you other folks, Sigurd, Beric, and Farley, you guys came in here about late morning. So as far as time is concerned, that's what you know. You don't know how that relates to each other, but you guys will have to make the deductions. I mean, he could have been down here for days. He could have been down here just a few hours. You don't know. But just so I, you know. I, I, don't know. I don't know how long I've been down here. All right, so what would you guys like to do at this point? You could uh, 
The barricade can be dis disassembled, you can explore down that direction, or you could head down the other direction where Farley is currently located with the torch. What would you like to do? And set up your little marching order if you're going to move, or start taking apart the barricade. Do we want to fight the rats that we know, or do we want to go into the cave that we don't? Well, it, it seems to me that the barricade might keep the rats at bay for now, at least. No. No. That's where they came from yesterday. He says no. <laughs> no. They are in around us. They are watching us right now. The rat? The rat. Oh, they're watching us right now. I get it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, regardless of jokes, are we deciding to take down this barricade and take down the threat we know about? Or are we going into the unknown and hoping that nothing pops up? The rats came from the over the top barricade from behind and attacked me. Yeah. And I guess it would be wise to make sure that our backs are safe. I think we should kill the rats. I think so too. Alright. Then we agreed, my friends. Devin steps forward, heading towards the barricade now you can all help out there's enough room for four people to be right up here working now here's the question do you want to just go at it with weapons and kick down this thing and or do you want to be a little bit more stealthy about it and take it apart and so on and so forth it's 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 not a permanent structure you could take this down it'll take more time if you try to be stealthy about it but you can definitely make good time if you just smash your way through and move forward the choice is yours. I think definitely we won't don't want to take too much down because this looks like a really good kind of fatal funnel position we're in right here. What I thought yesterday was I noticed how the barricade was pointed toward me. So whatever's on the outside of that other side of that barricade was trying to prevent whatever is down this path from coming that way. <clears throat> or maybe big spider that we just killed. Would make sense. Possibly. Yeah. Who knows what lurks in the dungeons like these? Either way, that barricade's coming down. All right, so are we, we smashing it through or taking it apart lightly and stealthily? <clears throat> I suggest we stealthily take it apart. Yeah. I I'd be fine with doing it stealthily. I actually agree. I think trying to be a little quiet and uh, delaying the start of fight until we want to start it. Good idea. All right. I'd like all four of you, or at least all of you that are making, you know, working on this together, you can all do it. Uh, I would like you all to make either a thievery or a crafting check. So go ahead and roll your dice, either thievery Skill or crafting skill? <laughs> what is David, that? What's that? What does that mean? What's this? <laughs> Sounds like Loki's mischief to me. Uh, craft. Ooh. Oh, barrack, ooh. Barrack. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> We are the loudest fucking people in the dungeon. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> okay. The are... Who the got... dice have run out of good getting... numbers. All right, Ramirez, you We're have... We're getting all the bad rolls out of the way now. Ramirez, you have no problem just being oh so careful about this. You're, you're good at this thing. You know that. But everybody else, Sigurd and Barrack, they just they get clumsy about it. They're hitting each other in the head and shoulder with the wood, piling it in the wrong spot. And there's, there's some moments there that kind of set you back like, uh-oh, we're not being very stealthy about this. Uh, yeah, so 
at that guys. point. Guys, pile the wood in the middle of the clearing here. Trust me. <laughs> me and Merrick are making a game out of it. <laughs> pile the wood in the middle of the clearing here. Okay. The reason is, is we can, if we need to escape, we can set it on fire. Sounds like a good... That sounds like a good plan. plan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that sounds smart. All right, so as you take it apart, that's what you see going down this tunnel. Do you want to head? Proceed down the tunnel? Yeah. Dwarf is first. I am second. We need the torch down the tunnel. All right, move yourself as far as you can down the tunnel. You should be able to see further into the opening uh, at the end of the tunnel. What looks like a room. You can proceed. As you enter this chamber beyond the barricade, an old cavern corridor winds down into the earth, ending in an ancient burial vault quite obviously, lit by a strange torch with blue flame. Alcoves line the walls, each one containing a rotting wooden coffin, while the center of the room has a raised platform holding a stone sarcophagus. And before you go any further, there's one to our right, right there. You see standing up in each of the coffins, as well as the central sarcophagus uh creatures made of bone and tattered cloth the creature in the center of the chamber near the blue light standing upright in the sarcophagus is this there's more flesh to this one but they're all in tattered cloth and rotting the other ones in the wooden coffins that flank they're more, they've obviously an older bodies. They're mostly just skulls and, and they're all animated and they all begin to turn and you can hear a clicking sound as they begin to move out of the coffins and sarcophagus towards you. Everybody roll initiative. All right, everybody use perception for your initiative. If you have to go to your character sheet and select perception, it's on page one as your initiative. Beric, you see these menacing creatures appear before you. The room is pretty much lit up by your torch in that blue flame that's at the foot of the sarcophagus, the stone one. Uh, you're up first. You see these creatures that obviously have been standing here looking towards the entrance. They see you. They're starting to clamor out of their coffins and move towards you. What would you like to do? First of all, I want to ready my sling. sling. Um, so, for one action, I ready my sling. Hmm. Just a second, I'll have to pick one can trick that I have. Disrupt Undead. Uh, you lance the target with energy. You deal 1d6 positive damage, plus your spellcasting ability mod, which I think is plus 4. It's your wisdom modifier. The target must attempt a basic fortitude save. If the creature critically fails the save, it also is enfeebled for one round. So basically, you're going to do damage. If you want, you can accept this roll. Uh, range, yeah. is, range is 30 feet, so any undead within 30 feet of you are going to suffer 9 points of positive damage. Yeah, I was just thinking that was it possible to target to the zombie shambler? So I think he's in range at least. I believe the, the zombie creature in the middle and the two skeleton creatures to the right of you on the bottom and the south, they're all within range, but I think the other ones are not further to the north. But yeah, I can target 
that skeleton that is closest to secret. All right, with your divine power of Shellen, your 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 lance energy crumbles the skeleton to dust. It just falls apart, and the rags fold over the the the, the coffin. It just collapses into dust. You did a lot more damage than you expected with that. You have one more. You have uh, one more action. Well, then I think I raise my shield. Just in case. <laughs> Next up is going to be Farley. What would you like to do? You see these skeletons around you. The one closest to you on your right has been destroyed, evidently by the power of Shalin. Um, I want to... The... I want to drop my torch so that I can free up a hand. Um... And then would that's inspecting a that like yeah that's a free action would inspecting the blue flame be like my full round to see what's going on there the one right adjacent to the zombie yeah well inspect it in what way just stare at it you're kind of distant yeah, from it see, yeah, see what's going on. If I can tell if there's something going on there. Well, or I, do I, I need to get closer for that? If you really want to take a look at it and investigate it, that's going to take up some time. But from the distance where you're at, you can see, for free, I'll give this to you, just a description. It looks like it's some kind of torch set in the bottom of the, the stone sarcophagus. It looks just like a torch. The only difference is that it has flickering blue flames coming off the end of it. And it's giving off this nice tone of blue light in the room, just like a torch. Uh, that's what that's the obvious thing you can see. It is a light source. It's a it's a propane torch. Huh. Um we have found the grave of Hank Hill. <laughs> okay, come on. Come on. Come on. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Farley. All right, so I'm going to cast Produce Flame. Put as it a can trip. Okay, put it in the chat so I can read it and we can all see it. Yep. Give me one moment here. Oh, it's an attack. Okay, a small ball of flame appears in the palm of your hand, and you'd lash out with it either in a melee or at range. Make a spell attack roll against your target's armor class. This is normally a ranged attack, but you can also make a melee attack against a creature uh, in your unarmed reach, which is five feet. Jason. On a success, you do 1d4 fire damage plus your spell casting ability mod, which is wisdom or intelligence for you, which would be a plus four. So it's basically just a spell attack. Now, if this was your attack, you would have got an 18. Uh, you could do it at range. Also, so who's your target? I'll make you roll this again because I just um, wanted to see this. Who's your Who's your target? Yeah. I'm going to target uh, the big bad zombie that's next to the blue torch. All right. That should be about 20 feet considering diagonals, I think. 5, 10, 15, 20. You know, you're in range. So go ahead and roll that attack again. You're going to get a plus four on this. I uh, Actually, just roll the produce flame again against the zombie. Describe your attack as it strikes soundly this undead creature. Uh, I take some of the uh, embers from the torch that rise up as I drop it, and I turn it into a small... Uh, into a small, like, uh, glass slipper, and I chuck it straight at its head, and it shatters in a small burst of flame when it connects with ground or um, the uh, zombie. 
Okay, so you hit. You did six points of damage. Wasn't it critical? Very good. The flames start to wrap around and lick around its hair. His hair starts to catch on fire. He moans and screams and what sounds he can make. <coughs> and with that, I think you're done. That was two actions to do that. All right, very good. Yeah, um, yep. Very good. All right, next is going to be Sigrid. Madness all around you. Your axe is drawn, or well, is it your spear? You did retrieve your spear, correct? I did have my spear, but uh, we were in a little tunnel. Okay. Uh, I'll say I have my spear at the moment. Okay. So, because we were going to be fighting rats, I was keeping them over the dwarf's head. Okay. But regardless. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the one that was next to me died, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So uh, she's going to throw the spear at the big guy in the middle. Oh! Ooh. 26, that's a critical. She rolled a 20. So whatever the result of 26 is, it's going to be one better, which is probably going to be a critical hit. Let me check its armor class. Yes, you scored a critical hit. Roll your double damage. So, uh, I just click damage and it does it on its own, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh my god. So she rolled a one on her damage roll, which is doubled with all her modifiers. She got eight points of damage piercing. All right, so your spear sinks into the zombie very accurately. You do some decent damage on him, but it's still standing. It is yet to move forward. You guys are just oh, nailing it. I get two more actions, right? Yeah, you do. So your spear is no longer available. You won it. What's next? Okay. Uh, I'm going to draw my axe and raise my shield, and that'll be my turn. All right, so ready the ax and raise shield. Devin, he's watching the rear. He's pretty much gonna leave it for you guys. He's got his shield and his sword out watching the rear of the party. His actions are done. Next, we're gonna go to you, Ramirez. You're up. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to have my hand crossbow readied. Okay, so you don't have to ready that. You could I'll with one action. Just fire with it. Now, if you want to fire through your friend's squares, which you would be doing, that will give an armor class bonus to the target. Like, for instance, the zombie or the skeleton on the far end because your friends no, are in I'm the way. Gonna... You could alternatively to... move forward and, and get in front of your friends so they're no longer blocking your view. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm moving forward right there. You can move 25 feet with one action. There you go. That's nice. That's one action. And from there, I will shoot the zombie in the middle by the sarcophagus. Okay, that's about 20 feet. Go ahead and make your ranged attack. It's your first attack with the hand crossbow. All right, you scored a 21. Uh, it's not critical, so you did normal damage, which in this case is only one piercing. So let me adjust the hit points as this crossbow bolt sinks into the zombie's forehead. Oh, but it does not slay him. Mm. That was your second action. Now, I believe the reload of your hand crossbow is one. Mm -hmm. That means I'll, you... I'll, I'll take an action to reload the crossbow. All right. That is your three actions. You're mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, from the northern part of the room, you hear that familiar clanking noise, Sigrid. Oh, God. Clanking noise. Mm -hmm. You mean what I thought was crabs? <laughs> yeah, the clicking noise. And although you hear it, you're not the one it attacks. It descends on you, Farley, and it starts raking forward with its claws. And... Armor class 20. So I believe that hits. It's not critical, I don't believe. What's your armor class? 
Uh, it should be, I believe it's only 12. All right, it's not critical. It's going to do six points of slashing damage as its claws rake your face and your arm, tearing your clothing. There we go. And then it, it continuously rakes at your face, but you, you managed to avoid any more strikes, but you did take some damage initially. Another skeleton creature has moved, uh, but is not able to reach you. Uh, to your right, climbing out of the coffin, the wooden rotted coffin, to the right of you guys in the south, Right in front of you, Sigrid, this skeletal creature. It's unarmed, basically, but it does do, looks pretty threatening with those claws, and it attacks you. With a 19, does that hit you? Oh. Yes, it does. Uh, it does, but I am going to use my shield to uh, reduce that. All right, shield block. And it will attack a second time against you and see how good it does here. And you're able to avoid any further damage. Thankfully, your shield and your axe parrying the blows of this creature does no further damage. So you're okay. And with that, near the center of the room, You've been nailing on this guy with flames, spears, crossbow bolts, but it's not finished off, and it begins to move forward. Moves to you, Farley. It's not armed, but it has some nasty-looking, meaty hands, and it's funny because he has a crossbow bolt stuck in its head, <laughs> and it's just looking right at you anyway, and it launches into you with a series of blows with its fists. Farley! Uh-oh. I don't think you were ready for this. 16 points of bludgeoning damage. This was a critical hit on your armor class of 12. You took 16 yeah. bludgeoning hits, damage. Okay. Ouch. I think I, I put it down at the ground. It's at my body. Pick it up and set the guy on fire. He's a bone. He's a like, he's a mummy. Set him on fire. That means you now are dying. So you collapse to the ground. You have the prone condition, and you have the dying two condition. So make a note on paper that you're dying two. If you reach dying four, you're dead. Also, you will be moved in the initiative order to just before the creature that did this to you. So I'm going to put you at initiative. Five. Let me change your initiative. Boom. Now, at the very start of your turn, which is initiative five now, you're going to make a death save or a death roll. And it's a flat check of 10 plus your dying value, which is two. You need to roll equal or higher than that to reduce your dying status by one. Okay? So we'll go further into it when we get to it. Right now, the zombie is done. It's finished. Take note, it only did two actions. I'll say no more. Next up, Beric. We're in the next start of the next turn. You saw your elven friend collapse before you from a hail of fist blows from this big, meaty creature with its hair half burned off, a bolt sticking out of its forehead, a spear sticking out of its stomach. <laughs> It's not looking good, but boy, did it ravage the wizard. And it's directly in front of you. To your left, a bone creature is attacking this newfound friend you just met earlier. Uh, and there's one to your right as well, but uh, Sacred seems to be holding her own. With shield and axe in hand. What do you do? The closest threat is the skeleton zombie. The skeleton and zombie directly in front of you. What do you do? So, I have my sling ready, but can I fire it upon the zombie at this range? Uh, I mean, just because there is the skeleton is right next to me. So, if you want to target so, either one, the skeleton or the zombie, you can do so without any 
problem. Now, the one directly in front of you is the zombie. He's hovering over the elf's body. He's got 10 feet on you. That would be your range. So he's well within range. If you want to make a ranged attack against him, go for it. There you go. Just make your sling attack. Yeah. Let's reload one. Okay. All right, you hit armor class five. Uh, the stone goes whipping past wow. him over his shoulder and ricochets off the back wall. That's your first action. I reload and throw another stone at the zombie. Attack number two, propulsive nine. Again, I, I guess it's just the, being unnerved by the fact that the elf just went down. He's obviously unconscious. You miss. The stone goes whipping past him. This creature turns to look at you. Barrack. your final action is done. We're going to move to Farley. Now, at this point, Farley, I want you to make a flat check plus your dying condition value, which is two. So, you're 12. You have to roll 12 or higher to reduce your dying condition by one. Go ahead and just roll a straight up d20. There's no other modifier. There's no modifiers to this. Oh, you got a natural 20. So what happens here is that you succeed. And instead of reducing your dying value by one, you reduce it by double, by two, which means you stabilize. You come, you're not awake, you're still unconscious, but you stabilize. You're no longer dying, and you have the wounded one. Oh no, you don't even have the wounded condition because you do have a critical. So you're good, you're not wounded, and you're stable. The only thing is you're unconscious, so somebody has to wake wow. you up or give you one hit point. As soon as you have one hit point, you become conscious again. Okay? So somebody has to heal you. But you're not dying. You're safe. All right, Farley, you are done, but you're no longer dying. So congrats. That was a good roll. Sigrid, things aren't looking good. You're facing off against not one but two creatures directly in front of you. One is a meaty looking zombie that just will not go down. It's got crossbow bolts stuck in its head. Thanks to your newfound friend. Uh, he just put down the elf. You got a skeleton in front of you. What are you going to do? Well, Sigrid is going to bellow a war cry to one of the gods of the saga. And she is going to lay into this big one with a power attack. All right. Followed probably by a regular attack. So how do I make a power attack? There it is. Two actions. You unleash a particularly powerful attack that clobbers your foe and leaves you a bit unsteady. Make a melee strike, as you normally would. This counts as two attacks when calculating your multiple attack penalty. If this strike hits, you deal an extra die of weapon damage. So it's based on the weapon you're using. You're using an axe. I think that's, what, 1d8, 1d6, something like that? 1d8. But you're going you're gonna to roll two of them. Okay. So go ahead and make a normal attack with your weapon. Yep. Sigrid plants her feet and, and reaches back and just attempts to bury that axe in that thing's fucking chest <laughs> or so region. Yeah. And, uh... Ah! Oh, my God. The hit, no? All right, your axe comes whipping around, and you do manage to catch it right in the lower waist. And you feel the power of the axe begin. Roll your damage. Two dice. Oh, I did hit it? Yes, you did. Okay, so I would say if I didn't hit it, I was going to spend a hero point, but I did hit it. You did hit it. So basically, roll your okay. damage twice and add them together. Uh, 19. <laughs> you got 11 and an 8, 19 points of slashing damage. And with yeah. that, you cut through the beast. Describe as you cut away the legs from this creature and it collapses dead. Well... 
Sigrid's mighty long hafted axe just just chops through the, the soft flesh of this thing like a like a hot knife through a stick of room temperature butter <laughs> and and she's going to continue on with her swing and hit this one over here if she can on the on the on the back swing my weapon has the sweep property oh you gain a plus one circumstance to your attack if you attack a different target uh, you gain a plus one bonus to your roll if you already attempted to attack a different target this turn. So, plus one circumstance. They're basically my. When you attack with this weapon, you gain a plus one circumstance bonus to your attack roll if you already attacked a different target this turn using this weapon. So, and yeah, and you finished them off too. So, you can carry through with your axe swing into the skeleton. And you're going to get a plus one to this. We'll do this in our head. Make another battle axe attack. This will be attack number uh, three. three. It's, isn't it three uh, plus one penalty or something? She just hits the... Yeah, so I actually got a 13. Yeah, you got a 13, uh, which is not enough. It manages to avoid your blow, and your axe comes up around the other side, ready for another strike, but unfortunately your turn is done. So you're done, and Devin, how's it going? How's it going up there? He's going to move forward, and he's going to ready his shield. Nope, I don't have any more heals. Spells. All right, so he's done. Ramirez, you're next. You see a lot going on. To your right, you hear this new friend of yours this blonde-haired warrior, screaming and hollering with an axe flying through the air and her shield zipping about. She just totally decimated this big, fleshy, zombie-like creature. Uh, so there's this big open space where the elf was and where the zombie was. The, the elf is still down on the ground. All right. But directly in front of you, more importantly, All right. there's this creature coming down with you and another one behind him coming up Maybe to attack you. Right. So what do you do? What I'm going to do, I'm going to drop the crossbows as a free action. Gotcha. Non-penalized action. And I'm going to pull my long sword as an action. Okay. And then I'm going to take a my first attack roll against the zombie thing in front of me. The okay. skeleton. Okay. Straight okay. up roll. All right. Here we go. That'll be your number one attack, so there's no penalties on this. Correct. This is my first attack again with a long sword uh, against the skeleton in front of me. Okay. Huzzah! Now, this is the versatile P weapon. It has versatile, so it means before you roll your attack, you can choose to make it piercing instead of slashing. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. I didn't see that. That's okay. The default is slashing. Uh, mm -hmm. You did manage to connect against this creature. Some of the bones snap. Not as many as you thought, because your blade kind of kind of misses the mark as it slides through empty air in the bones between the ribs. But you do do damage. So you did hit. I'd, it's... I'd like to take a second attack. Uh, minus... Four, five, at minus five. All right, number two. Sigurd is AFK. Uh, unfortunately, you just cannot connect with the blade. It just keeps missing as it, as it hits between the ribs or you're not a very mm -hmm. effective attack. Of course, you're not a fighter, but yeah, you missed. And that is your third action. Ramirez, you are done. All right, next up. Ramirez. The, skele the, the skeleton in front of you starts reaching mm -hmm. and cutting at you, slashing with its claws once again. Uh, you're able to avoid it quite easily. It attacks a second time. 
What's your armor class? It's, uh, 16. Well, it attacks you with a series of clawing attacks. God, it's almost like he start, he's trying to bite you as well. You, say, you tend to keep out of his, his grasp, but he does make a connection at the end. Five points of slashing damage as the claws just rake across your chest. I'm down two hit points now. Where'd the other one go? Oh, it's standing over our buddy. Yeah, standing over your buddy, Beric. This creature moves forward, standing over the elf's body. It starts to lash out at you with its claws. Uh, and it took, takes you by surprise. It was a close one. Take three slashing damage. Sigurd, the one next to you, starts clawing at you. I don't think you have your shield raised, do you? No, you spend it all on your attacks. No, I do not. Well, its first attack does not do anything. You're lucky it out. Attacks you again. And it does manage to hit. You take five points of slashing damage. So it does connect with you. And that's about it. And it is done. And that finishes his turn. So, the three skeletons have adjusted their position. You're all squared off against them. Sigurd, Beric, there's one in front of you. As well as Ramirez. It is. They're just clawing at you with this silent motion. I mean, they're not making any sounds obviously other than just the clanking of the bones but they are connecting with you guys <clears throat> Beric, you're up you had two skeletons in front of you my friend yeah um, uh ramirez is obviously not feeling well at this point so i'll put my sling uh prepare my club and try to hit the Skeleton in front of Ramirez. Okay. Ooh, you it rolled was a, that one. You rolled a twenty. <laughs> you scored a twenty-five. Now that's not a critical hit normally. A twenty-five wouldn't be a critical hit, but you rolled a twenty, which means a success, which is what it is, becomes a critical success. So go ahead and roll critical damage on this. Ouch. Massive damage. Now, these creatures seem to be quite fragile to begin with, and this one has already taken some damage from Ramirez, uh, swinging at it with his sword. But, Beric, you absolutely cave its skull in and turned it to dust as it collapses to the floor. Well done. I'm just so, I'm just so happy that that the description didn't come after a, a failed healing roll. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it. Well done. I think you have another action, don't you? Yeah. One more. I'll raise my shield. Raise your shield. Okay. And finally you're still laying there unconscious fortunately you don't have to make any more death rolls you just basically you have the unconscious condition all right so somebody just has to wake you up or give you healing and as soon as you get one hit point you're automatically woken up so we're going to go right to sigrid sigrid you're up you got one on the left hovering over the elf and you got yeah. one in front of you battle well, accident the one on the left hovering the one on the left hovering over the elf is... Uh, which one has looks the worst for wear? Uh, well, both... Neither one has been hit yet by anybody. Uh, then I'm going to swing at the one at the elf and carry through with my swing to the one to my right. There you go. So I'm going to make one attack on this guy, and then I'll sweep to this guy. Gotcha. So your first attack. Go for it. And then I'm going to raise my shield. <laughs> Oh my god. So you're old. Well, fourteen damage. Fourteen right. damage, it just it just crumbles from your blow. Go ahead and make your second attack with a plus one, I believe, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, I can't put that in here. We'll just have to add one to whatever I roll, so. Ah, bah, that's fine. Plus, plus one is ten. And let me double check the armor class. Nope, that is not going to do it. It's not a critical failure, which doesn't matter. I'm not using fumbles. So, yeah. Yeah. You're good. That's your first attack, and your second attack. My third action. Go ahead. And then I'm going to raise my shield. All right, raise shield. Well done, Sigurd. You're proving your worth in battle, that's for sure. Devin, let me see. I wanted to use my healing spell, but I'm trying to conserve on him. He's going to hold his action. I'm going to go to Ramirez. Ramirez, you're freed up. The skeletons that were in front of you are no more. The dwarf is to your right flank. Uh, what do you want to do? Yeah. I'm going to... Um, can I... Um, is there a, uh, a way that I can move behind it and get it catch it flat-footed? Yeah, you could. You could move behind it and be flanking it. That'll make it flat-footed. And then your attack would gain that bonus, the sneak attack damage of 1d6. Yeah, but that. Precision damage, it's called. I'm going to do that. Let's see here. Five, ten, fifteen. Now, at this point, if you move behind it, if it has attack of opportunity, it could attack you at this point because you're within reach of him. But you don't know if he has attack of opportunity or not, so that's the risk you take. You have 25 feet to move. Okay. Every You can move diagonal. Every second diagonal you make counts an extra five feet has moved. So keep that in mind. Otherwise, I, it's five I foot go. per square. One. That's five. Ten. Fifteen. Right. I'm going to come right here and attack him from here. Actually, it's You're not... 15, 20. 20. Right. There's, there. So go ahead and spend your second action to uh, attack. All right, so... So you won't get sneak attack with the longsword. Yeah. It only has versatile. But I, I, will, I will catch him flat, though. You'll still get the bonus. Yeah, the two hit bonus. You attacked, got a seven... You are flanking him. It is flat-footed. Uh, that is not going to hit, so you have one more action, I believe. Well, one more action? Mm -hmm. Because I'm wounded, I'm going to move okay. back away. One, two, three, four, five. All right. All right, you're done. Next up, we have the last skeleton squaring off against Sigrid. And you guessed it. Claws! It reaches to you, Sigrid. And it manages to connect. You take three slashing damage. Did you, the first one did connect. That's it. All right, there's its three actions. And this combat is still going on. Barrick, what are you going to do? Your friend, the elf, lays in front of you. You can see his stomach rising and dropping. He's still alive. Sigrid seems to have the other skeleton in control of the situation. What would you like to do? At this point, I'll remove first the shield token from the youth. And... Can I step over farly to yeah. face the skeleton? Yep. But if I step in the same, um, same square, can I attack from there? In, you want to move forward? Yeah, if I move here, right. can I attack? Yeah. Okay, then I'll smash it with my club. Go for it. Trying to protect the fallen elf. Good old bludgeoning damage. Go for it. 
16. That hits. Seven points of damage. Oh, you just destroy. First, it was the arm. Then it was the right rib cage that you just smashed right in. And this thing just collapses in a pile of bones before you. You have defeated it. Well done. Now it's time to Beric for start wildly dancing that he actually hit something. <laughs> and with that, oh. the battle descends into silence. Sigrid takes pause. Devon turns about behind him, watching the corridor to the rear. You can hear the breathing of the elf underneath you, Beric. All is silent as the blue glow of the torch flickers. There's also a torch underneath your feet, or underneath you as well, uh, Beric, that the elf was holding. The combat is over, as far as you know. Yay! I want to pass the torch for to Secret or Devon, whichever wants to take it. Uh, Sigrid will take it, and she'll uh, hold the torch in one hand, and her uh, she'll actually hold the torch in one hand and her and her shield in the other for now. Okay, so we're out of encounter mode. We're now in exploration mode again. <coughs> so take stock and let me know what you want to do. Um, I, I would like to make an arcana check on the blue flame the torch all right so like so what kind of arcan arcana check what are you doing what kind of magic is it is oh. it um is it good magic bad magic is it um is it harmful to us you know all what right kind of, what kind of magic you know all right first of all What you're doing is called a recall knowledge check, in this case, arcana. Now, you're not particularly good at this stuff, obviously, because you're not trained in arcana like a wizard might be. But that doesn't mean you can't go back into your memory banks and try and maybe recall something about something about uh, magical torches, for instance. So there's a possibility that you might know something about this. This is called a recall knowledge check. Arcana. So what you will do is you're going to make an Arcana roll. Just go to your skill section and roll Arcana. And I'll have a DC for right. you. Making the roll now? Mm-hmm. Nothing springs to mind about anything that might be magical about this torch, but Obviously, there's something magical about it, but you don't know what it could be or whether it's some demonic occultish thing or whatever. But uh, other than it seems magical, that's about all you know. It takes somebody with greater knowledge, I think, to find out more than that. Your Arcana? First of all, right off the bat, Devin does sense magic in this area. He does have the cantrip detect magic going. So he does detect magic, you guys. So there is that. And Ramirez, if you want, at this point, use an identify magic on this thing. And give me a roll. This is an arcana roll. Okay. Here we go. All right. All right. So outside of what I told you already about this, I mean, it's got to be something about this torch that makes it do what it does but you don't recall anything or hearing or reading anything about it and trying to identify it doesn't do you no good either i mean that's it i mean you're gonna have you're gonna have to wait at least another day before you attempt to do this again and try and identify it alternatively you do have an elf in the group that's laying here seemingly dead uh sleeping away I have been waiting for things to unravel. I was thinking that I might try to be brave enough to try to heal poorly. Oh, I actually have proficiency in medicine. I didn't realize that. 
best provider, I guess. So, Secret, do you want to test your luck with the healing? I had bad results the last time. <laughs> uh, I, elf physiology is new, but sure, I'll, I'll go. Okay, I'm going to make a medicine roll now with the healer. So you got a 21. That did, is yeah. that is good. It's not critical success. That would be a, a, a result of 30. Uh, so he gets 2d8 hit points back. So roll 2d8. I roll them? Yeah. <laughs> there right. we go. 10 hit points, Farley. And that will that will put you at 10 hit points. And with that, you wake up and come to consciousness. You no longer have the unconscious condition. You're basically just prone. And remember, because you got a critical success on your flat check to see if you died, you're not wounded either. Yeah. You have a hearty elven body. Now, before we go any further, I did put it in the chat, but everybody gets 100 experience points. So you're now at 230, I believe. Congratulations. Yeah. And that concludes episode one, Menace Under Otari, from the Pathfinder Beginner's Box 2E. Good stuff, folks. We're having a really good time playing this out. I hope you guys had a ball watching. Uh, stay tuned for episode two. We'll pick up where we left off and see what the heroes do next. Do they call it quits, head to the surface, or do they delve deeper into the gloom under Otari? Stay tuned, folks. Anyway, folks, like, share, subscribe, all that goodness. Let me know what you think. You want to see more of these? Again, let me know. Till next time, folks, hang in there. It's only going to get better.